In order for the cells of our body to actually be able to function effectively and efficiently, they have to have a large enough supply of oxygen because it's the oxygen that is used in aerobic cellular respiration to produce ATP energy molecules. Now, the hemoglobin molecule is the protein that is responsible for carrying the oxygen from the lungs and to the tissues and cells of our body. So if our cells are to function correctly, the hemoglobin must be able to bring enough oxygen and release enough oxygen in the tissues of our body. And previously, we spoke about one allosteric effector molecule, namely 2,3-BPG, that binds into this center pocket in that deoxyhemoglobin, stabilizing the T-state of the deoxyhemoglobin and decreasing the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. And this is precisely what allows that hemoglobin to basically release enough oxygen to the tissues of our body. Now, as it turns out, 2,3-BPG is not the only allosteric effector for hemoglobin. There are two other molecules found inside our body, inside the red blood cells, that can bind onto a special region of the hemoglobin other than the oxygen binding side and decrease the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, thereby shifting the oxygen binding curve to the right side. And these two molecules are hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide. So once again, 2,3-BPG is not the only allosteric effect that improves the efficiency of hemoglobin. Hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide are also allosteric effectors that increase the amount of oxygen that is released by hemoglobin in the exercising tissues of our body. And this effect is known as the Bohr effect. So the Bohr effect is basically the ability of hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide to bind onto the hemoglobin molecule, stabilizing its T-state and decreasing its affinity for oxygen, thereby shifting the curve to the right side and to see what we mean by this let's take a look at the following diagram so this diagram describes three different oxygen binding curves for hemoglobin under three different conditions. So the black curve describes the condition in which we don't have any carbon dioxide present and we have a normal pH of 7.4 which is the pH found inside our lungs. The blue curve describes the conditions in which we don't have any carbon dioxide, but we decrease our pH, so we increase the hydrogen ion concentration, to, uh, so the pH decreases to about 7.2. And the red curve describes the condition under which we have about 40 millimeters of mercury of carbon dioxide present in that surrounding area. And we also decrease the pH to 7.2. So once again, we increase the hydrogen ion concentration as compared to this case here. And notice that when we don't have any CO2 present, but we lower the pH, the black curve actually shifts to the blue position. And when we keep the pH at 7.4 and we add carbon dioxide, the blue curve shifts to where the red curve is. So we see that hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide together create the Bohr effect, which actually shifts that entire oxygen binding curve of hemoglobin towards the right side. And what that means is it decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. And what that means is it allows the hemoglobin to actually unload and release more oxygen to the tissues of our body and to see how much more is actually released, let's take a look at this graph. So let's begin inside the lungs. So inside the lungs, we basically have a concentration of oxygen of about 100 millimeters of mercury. So the Y coordinate of all these three different curves is exactly the same. It's around 0.98, which is equivalent to 98% saturation of hemoglobin. Now, when we go into the exercising tissues, the concentration of our oxygen drops to about 20 millimeters of mercury. And notice that at this particular point, we have three different Y coordinates. 
For this black curve, the y coordinate is around 0.32. For the blue curve, the coordinate is around 0.21. And for the red curve, the coordinate point is around 0.1. And what that means is, for that black curve, when we have a pH of 7.4 and no carbon dioxide present inside our exercising tissues, the hemoglobin will be 32% saturated with oxygen. However, if we drop the pH to about 7.2, and once again, no CO2 is present, now in the exercising tissues, the hemoglobin will be able to unload more oxygen because our fractional saturation drops. We now have about 20% saturation of hemoglobin. And finally, if we drop the pH and we increase the concentration of carbon dioxide to about 40 millimeters of mercury, then at a partial pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury for oxygen inside the excising tissues, we're going to have 10% saturation of hemoglobin. And so these will be the percentages of hemoglobin that are going to be able to unload and release that oxygen. So in this particular case, the black curve tells us 98% minus 32% gives us 66% of the hemoglobin will be able to release the oxygen to the tissues. In the case of the absence of carbon dioxide but a lower pH, so a higher concentration of hydrogen ions, we're going to be able to unload 98 minus 21 or 77% of that oxygen. So 77% of the hemoglobin will unload and release that oxygen. And finally, for this case, in the presence of carbon dioxide and a lower pH, meaning a higher concentration of H plus ions, 88% of the hemoglobin will be able to unload that oxygen. So we see not only does 2,3-BPG shift the curve to the right side and lower the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, but so does the hydrogen ion concentration and the carbon dioxide concentration. And these three molecules, 2,3-BPG, H plus ions, and CO2 molecules together create a very effective hemoglobin molecule that is able to actually unload a lot of those, many of those oxygen molecules to the tissues of our body. So a higher concentration of CO2 and a lower pH, meaning a higher amount of H plus ions, because remember, as we increase the H plus ions, we decrease our pH. So these two things shift the curve to the right, thereby decreasing the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen and allowing the hemoglobin to unload or release more of those oxygen molecules into the exercising tissues, the cells of our body. Now, how does this actually take place? So let's begin with the pH effect. And let's focus on this blue curve here. So as of now, we're not focusing on increasing or decreasing the CO2 concentration. We're only increasing, we're only focusing on the pH effect, increasing the H plus ion. So why is it that when we increase the H plus ions in the red blood cells and in our blood system, why is it that the curve shifts to the right? How do these H plus ions actually affect that hemoglobin molecule? Well, it turns out that in the, hemo in the hemoglobin molecule, we have several groups that can actually bind H plus ions. So one of the group is basically the terminal residue, the amino group on the terminal residue of the alpha subunits and the other group are the histidine residues found on the beta 146 position and the alpha 122 position. So these groups on the hemoglobin molecule can actually bind H plus ions. And by binding H plus ions, those ions can then participate in forming stabilizing salt bridges. And to see what we mean by that, let's take a look at the following diagram. So, this is the histidine 141 residue found on the beta-1 subunit. And this is a nearby residue on the same beta-1 subunit, the aspartate 94. 
Now notice in this particular case, so at a relatively high pH of let's say 7.4, which is the pH inside our lungs, this nitrogen, so by the way, this is the nitrogen, these are carbons, and, and these uh, blue ones are oxygen molecule, uh, oxygen uh, atoms, and this orange one is an H ion. So basically this is the histidine residue and this is the aspartate residue. And at a relatively high pH, so let's say at the normal pH of 7.4, the pH is not low enough to actually uh, add an H plus ion onto this nitrogen. And so this nitrogen will be missing an H plus ion and no bond will be formed between these two groups. But as we lower the pH and increase the concentration of the H plus ions, now we approach the pKa value of this residue, which is about seven, uh, seven. And so what that means is we have enough H plus ions so that the H plus ions can protonate this nitrogen. And by protonating this nitrogen, we basically create this nitrogen hydrogen bond. And now the hydrogen, which bears a partial positive charge, can interact with the negatively charged oxygen atom of the uh, of the side chain of the aspartate 94 amino acid. And this forms a salt bridge. A salt bridge is basically a stabilizing electric interaction between these two adjacent atoms. And by forming this salt bridge, we essentially decrease the net charge in that localized region and that stabilizes the T state, the 10th state of that deoxyhemoglobin molecule. And what that does is it lowers the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen and makes it more likely to unload that oxygen to the tissues of our body. And that means it shifts the entire curve to the right side. And that's precisely why when we go from no CO2 pH of 7.4 to no CO2 and a pH of 7.2, because we increase our H plus ion concentration, we essentially form these salt bridges and that basically shifts the black curve to the blue position shown here. So once again, as the hydrogen ion concentration increases, the histidine side chain becomes protonated. So this nitrogen is protonated to form this bond here. And this allows us to form salt bridges, which are a stabilizing electric interaction with the nearby aspartate side chain. This salt bridge stabilizes the T state of the deoxyhemoglobin, thereby lowering its affinity for oxygen and allowing to unload more of the oxygen to the tissue. So this is our uh, stabilizing salt bridge. It's called a salt bridge because we have a partial positive charge and a partial negative charge on this side. So this is how the pH effect actually creates uh, or allows the hemoglobin to unload more oxygen. Now, what about the carbon dioxide effect? So carbon dioxide is produced inside the exercising cells of our body. So if our muscles are contracting, we're producing more CO2 molecules. Now, the thing about CO2 molecules is they're nonpolar molecules and they can easily uh, move across the cell membrane of the tissue cells, move into our blood system and then move into the red blood cells because they don't have a charge and they can easily pass across the cell membrane. Brain. Along with that, we also have special, pro, uh, special protein transporters in the cell membrane that allow the carbon dioxide to basically be brought into the red blood cell. Now, once the CO2 is inside the red blood cell, it reacts with water. And with the help of a special enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase, we transform CO2 and water into carbonic acid. And then because carbonic acid is a relatively good acid, it will dissociate into H plus ions and into bicarbonate ions. The, bar uh, the bicarbonate ion will have a negative charge, the H plus ion will have a positive charge. Now notice one important thing. 
When we have a higher concentration of CO2, that means we're going to produce a higher concentration of H plus ion. So one mechanism by which CO2 shifts the curve to the right side is actually by increasing the H plus concentration and therefore decreasing the pH and causing the pH effect. And for the reason we spoke just a moment ago, by increasing the H plus concentration and decreasing the pH, we form these salt bridges, which stabilize the structure of the T state of the deoxyhemoglobin that decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, shifts the curve to the right side and allows the hemoglobin to release more O2 molecules to the exercising tissues of our body. Now, the next question is, how does CO2 directly affect our hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen? So, just like H plus ions can bind onto the hemoglobin molecule at special groups, the CO2 molecules can also bind onto the hemoglobin on special groups. So, it turns out that carbon dioxide can also bind onto